Uh, let me for the introduction. Uh, probably for most of you, especially most of you from the Hanley community, uh, Igor doesn't need the introduction. But let me just give a brief introduction to the whole uh, group. So Professor Klavanov uh, um, has done many influential works, especially in high energy theory. And just to list a few among the prominent works, including uh, his work on matrix model and non-critical string theory, his works on black brains and page gravity correspondence, and the Kavanaugh weighted model of conformal field theory uh, with zinc to supersymmetry, and the Kavanaugh stressler model of confining gauge theory. And also his work on um, this higher spin ADSF correspondence together with Polakov, and more recently his work on entanglement entropy in conformal field theories and F theorems well, for renormalization group flows, and even more recently his work on uh, large and tensor models and star states, uh, scar states in lattice models and two dimensional QCD. Uh, Professor uh, Klapanov uh, was originally from uh, Kharkiv, uh, USSR. And nowadays, uh, that's in Ukraine. Uh, he uh, received his PhD at Princeton University in 1986 under the supervision of uh, Kurt Kahn. And he was a postdoc for three years at Slack uh, before joining Princeton University as a faculty member uh, in 1989. Uh, professor Kabanov is currently uh, Eugene Higgins, a professor of physics at Princeton. Uh, he's also the director for the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science. And more recently, he's the director of this exciting new Simons collaboration on confinement and QCD strings. Uh, Professor Klavanov is a recipient of many uh, prizes and honors, uh, including uh, the Guggenheim Fellow Fellowship, uh, the Tomo Sonny Awards, the Palmer Chuk Prize, and Oscar Klein Medal. He's an uh, elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Uh, once we again, we're very happy to have uh, Professor Klavanov here with us. And Igor, um, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Yifan, for the invitation and this nice introduction. <laughs> and thank you for coming here. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, I came to New York at a relatively young age, so I in some ways always consider myself a New Yorker, <laughs> in addition to a of China. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so, so apologies for the wrong year. I was uh, revising the date and forgot uh, an important thing to change. <clears throat> so the colloquium will be uh, about strong interactions, which is my famous talk colloquium. Even when I worked on other things, I've somehow always talked about this stuff. And now I have additional reason to advertise it because uh, I'm now in this uh, exciting new collaboration. So let me just start very slow. Yeah, sometimes they tell me like aim it at uh, undergraduates and uh, so you'll find the beginning very boring probably, but just talking a bit about uh, how people sort of have this tongue in cheek uh, term or string theory, the theory of everything, uh, because it's supposed to explain everything. But, oops, oh, I'll hide the problem. But string theory, as we know, was invented uh, originally to describe strong nuclear interactions. So, Um, should I get some skin? Okay, but uh, so of course we all know how important strong the strong nuclear interactions are because we're all made a lot of our mass comes from the hadrons, uh, a term which was coined originally by Lev Okun, uh, and apparently it's inspired by this. Uh, Adras, which in Greek means heavy as opposed to leptos, meaning light. And uh, so 
So I think uh, I always feel regret that I'm too late in this field. I should have been <laughs> there in the 60s, but um, uh, when all these amazing discoveries of new particles were made, for example, there were these bubble chamber pictures like the one you see here, uh, where you have a charged K meson decaying into three pions. So this is certainly physics. Uh, um, so, so we know that the hadrons come in two varieties. Uh, one is baryons, which are like proton, neutron, lambda baryon, and, and so on, heavy flavor baryons. Now we know many of them. And then mesons, originally the pi meson, then kaon and rho were discovered. Then there was this so-called 1974 November Revolution. Uh, maybe some of you heard about this, uh, uh, when Jake Psy was discovered and that ushered in a whole new era of particle physics. Uh, so now, uh, of course, Jake Psy is a ch charmonium, charm, anti-charm uh, bound state. Okay, so what about strong force? It's very short range, but about 100 times stronger than electromagnetic, meaning that if you take G young mill squared over four pi, it's about a factor of a hundred bigger than the fine structure constant, which, which is uh, one over 137. And it's of course uh, responsible for holding atomic nuclei together uh, because there is of course strong electrostatic repulsion of protons and uh, something has to oppose it. So if there were no strong interaction, there would be no us, right? Uh, okay, uh, so now uh, the hadrons, of course, have, by now have well-known substructure, which is quarks and gluons. So quarks were initially conjectured uh, in the early 60s, I think, uh, uh, by Gelman and independently by Zweig, who called them aces. And uh, and then the so. At that point, there were only three quarks known, and now we call them the light quarks, up, down, and strange. Now we also know the three additional much heavier quarks, which is uh, charm, bottom, and, and top. And uh, so first people were grouping these known uh, uh, hadrons, say known mesons, into multiplets like octet. And this is their work content, and this was a huge breakthrough. But at that point, people were not quite sure if quarks were real things or they were just some something for bookkeeping, right? In fact, even philosophers were very preoccupied with whether quarks really exist or not. And when I came into the field, it was still a bit of a tail end of this philosophical stage. No. <laughs> Okay, so um, so and similarly, the, there are these uh, baryon multiplets like the neutron, proton, and so on. And these are the strange ones. These are containing two strange quarks. Uh, so these these strange bary uh, these uh, hadrons were proliferating, and that's why people uh, made this breakthrough of the quark substructure. Uh, and at that point. Uh, Around that time, somehow this was a phase when people were studying the S matrix of different baryons and uh, noticed some systematics, uh, uh, baryons and mesons, and noticed some systematics. For example, if you plotted the different particles, uh, spin as a function of mass squared, there was this approximately linear relation. This used to be called the chu froude plot, and this is called the leading ratio trajectory. Uh, so in this particular case, I'm showing the, the rho meson, which is spin one, then there is a spin two and so on, and then it continues to, to higher mass. But then these get very broad because uh, st strong interactions are strongly interacting. So everything is a bit fuzzy and messy. And that's why we don't have such uh, clarity up here. But I'll make a comment that if the number Okay, yeah, I'll comment on this a bit later. Okay, so, so then in an attempt to define the 
scattering of these various hadrons, uh, there was a big breakthrough when in 1968, Veneziano building actually on earlier work with Rubenstein, uh, Rosora, Demola, I don't remember. Everyone came up with this uh, Veneziano amplitude uh, with a linear trajectory. This alpha S and T are two kinematical invariants, which are just squares of momenta, basically. And, uh, and this satisfied some amazing properties that are needed for uh, that uh, was called duality at the time. I don't want to go too much into this, but in a nutshell, uh, soon after it was realized that there is a string, a quantum string behind this amplitude. And uh, so when a particle decays into two particles, it happens sort of at a point vertex. And this is how Feynman rules are built up, but a quantum string, say an open string, uh, decays by uh, this sort of process where, when it uh, falls apart in the middle, and this is a, a decay of an open string into two open string strings. And when even a single open string propagates, just like we have world line relativistic action for a particle, we have the non Bogota area action. For what string. is this alpha? Is it mass? Uh, alpha is. Uh, uh, you said it, range of trajectory, didn't you define it as mass versus spin? It's, it's dimensionless. It's, it's more like spin versus uh, mass squared. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah it's like Can I ask a related question? Um, how do you, because different spins, you, meaning field theorists, call different particles. How do you select which particles to include in the one range of what? Well, all the physically, all the integer spins, they, they really go up to infinity. Or so, just by proportionality of masses or something. Yeah, if you, if you, so what people very quickly manage to do is just to quantize their, their relativistic, uh, say, open string. And uh, the, its spectrum involves spins all the way from zero to infinity. Right, spins I understand, but how do you, there are, many particles of a given spin how do you select which particles they, they're all there there is some principle like it's true that for a given this is what uh, what is uh, oops yeah here there is a leading trajectory with a single particle uh, but then there are all these sub-leading daughter trajectories in the uh, so, so for a given spin there are infinite in this idealized Veneziano model, there is an infinite number of particles. Is it like all mesons that exist or what? Well, if, right, they, they so you're jumping ahead a little bit. Okay, the, the, lead, you the, leading the, Reggie, the leading Reggie trajectory is just basically a string spinning like this, but then you can also create vibrational excitation, which will increase the mass squared without increasing the spin. But this plot is experimental. So yeah, experimentally, is, you see some resonances. How do you select the resonances? Which well, well, no, the, the goal is to plot all of them. I mean, these get very broad. So at some point, it gets hard to identify them. But but if, in the idealized model where they're all there, there will be an infinite number. Of them. Yeah, it, it's like here is a string and it can rotate and vibrate. This these are pure rotational states, and then as you pluck them, they increase the mass. No, the interpretation I know. I'm asking how do you do it experimentally? Well, experimental. This is supposed to include everything, but but it's very complicated because these states, the width gets very high. So at some point, you don't know if the state is real or not. So it's all the resonances with a given quark quantum. No, this is supposed to be a plot of absolutely everything uh, with a given isotopic spin. Uh, here, the isotopic spin is one. This is the, it's called the row trajectory because I didn't say what isotopic spin was, but it basically assigns uh, up and down or a doublet of isotopic spin. So, in a given isotopic channel, this is like the plot of everything. It looks very clean for the leading trajectory, but it starts looking more and more messy for sub leading trajectory. Uh, okay, so. So this, this is like, a, a, you can say it's an idealized toy model for what people see in this experimental plot. It has some fatal flaws. For example, 
in the in the fully consistent model, you need 26 dimensions, and there is also a particle of negative mass squared. So that's why. So initially, people were super excited about this model, but as they were digging deeper, they ran into some problems. So, uh, but but it still stands as a monumental accomplishment in theory to the discovery of this amplitude, and and then it was generalized to more consistent theories, but uh, there they, they were super symmetric and so on. So, so this is certainly not uh, strong interactions on the nose. It's some kind of toy model for the theory of strong interactions. Okay, but now came, so what came along instead was, and part of the reason people were playing with the SES matrix is because somehow people had no hope that something better existed. But then in an absolutely amazing breakthrough, uh, people invented the exact theory of strong interactions. And, and it happened right around 50 years ago. In fact, now is the 50th anniversary year so, so the progression of ideas was that somewhere in the mid 60s, people realized that each quark, say each flavor quark really comes in three color states. Uh, and uh, so for example, Han and Nambu had these, but uh, their model was a little bit incorrect, but still essentially. Uh, and then uh, Bardeen, Fritsch, Gelman apparently had the very uh, important paper in the early 70s. Uh, and then there was this conference, ICHEP 1972 at Fermilab, uh, September of uh, 1972, when this is actually online. There was a paper by, I think, a talk that uh, Gelman gave based on work that Fritz and Gelman did. And they, uh, it was called The Advantages of Color Octet Gluon. So when people looked at mediation of forces between quarks, uh, initially people had just uh, a singlet gluon kind of mediator similar to photon. But then a competing model was this color octet. And, and there were just a few words about it and the mention of Young-Mills theory. And then in the span of a few months, this full uh, Lagrangian was formulated. This is the the gluon kinetic term, which is the analog of, uh, so for example, for the three color theory, this index A runs over eight values, which is the joint representation of SP3. Uh, but otherwise it's each one is like analog of electromagnetism. And then these sides are the quark fields and they couple to gluons. So there are mediators of the, of the color force. Historic question. They did not worry in the 60s that they did not know how to prove that the theory was generalizable or not. Uh, um, they did not care about it at all. Well, uh, so, so of course, Hoft in 1972 <coughs> proved it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm saying that. No, but this theory was not written down in the 60s. Uh, it was, I think this theory, so in words, it was described uh, in September 1972. That was uh, Gelman. I actually looked at Gelman's talk. It's online. But they did talk about young theory in the 60s when they were building standard. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it was, wasn't clear what it was really describing. Actually, if you look at Young Mill's paper, it, they were trying to describe their own meson. They, they, it was, in some ways, it was predicting the raw meson. And they were very confused why these young mills, what we now call gluons, why, why they are not mass, why we don't see these massless particles. Because the gauge invariance wants them to be. So that's in a nutshell the problem that's still unsolved, right? Because this is like, we know that for photons, no problem. You can see me, so there are massless photons. But gluons, of course, don't run around freely, right? They, so this Lagrangian was used by these three people uh, it was used by these three people to do the calculation of running in the UV, but uh, and this is called asymptotic freedom. So this is uh, the plot of the evolution of the strong analog of the fine structure constant. And you see how with essentially with energy, it falls off quite rapidly, right? 
like one over this uh, grows logarithmically. And that's the big discovery here. Uh, so, so the theory at short distances becomes more and more weakly interacting. But then, the, and that's called the asymptotic freedom of QCD that uh, has been honored by the Nobel Prize in 2004. But the opposite side of it is that the, this whole idea of like even defining alpha strong becomes fuzzy at the, at the scales below one GV, right? Uh, GV is giga electron volts. It looks like everyone here knows this stuff, so, <laughs> so it shouldn't feel bad about not defining things. But, uh, okay, so so this is uh, so QCD is often advertised as a perfect quantum field theory precisely because it gets weakly coupled with short distances. The reason people were pessimistic about quantum field theory in the '60s was this the QED model, right, which worked very well sort of at low energies, but then there was this problem of lambda of hole, and lambda famously said that we must bury the Lagrangian method. He used Hamiltonian for some reason. <laughs> he also used Lagrangian. Okay. And then, never mind. It, uh, with, with all appropriate honors, like it's a famous quote. quote uh, Actually, if this is a history of science talk, you can, there is a clip of Gelman talking about how he argued with Landau during the 1956 conference. And, and he basically was saying, this guy was impossible to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, Landau was wrong. Uh, because Gelman by then already had this Gelman low equation and uh, uh, but anyways, all of this becomes turned around in QCD. There is no, no pole, everything gets under control at short distances. But then the opposite side is that everything gets very strongly coupled at long distances uh, and it's hard to solve. So, and, and uh, so in particular, so that's why we're all still here talking about this. Uh, so the confinement problem is precisely why we don't observe free massless gluons propagating to infinity. Uh, we, uh, so, so the big breakthrough of 72 was this colored, colored gluon in addition to the quark is sort of 64, then colored gluon was, and, uh, and then one can even throw away quarks and just have a theory of gluons which are interacting with each other but they somehow get permanently confined. And, and this was sort of conjectured in the early 70s. I don't know who coined the term confinement. I think David Gross said it might have been Gelman also. So. But here is a picture of confinement at work, like when you make a high energy collision. First you see jets, but then these are energetic groups of particles called jets, and then they always hadronize and the detector you never see a gluon you just see the the actual colorless bound state but in the short run you can sometimes see for example if a free b like an almost free b quark running a certain distance and then it hadronizes so especially with these heavy quarks you see that quarks are real they're really observed for short periods of time uh, and then eventually everything turns into confined hadrons. If I'm saying something wrong, please interrupt. I've never worked on a detector collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's why, uh, so around the 2000, there was this sort of all these millennium problems and, uh, and at the Strings 2000 conference, there were these two, uh, top 10 questions for the new millennium. And then, but the Clay Foundation even put money onto this. And this is actually their number one problem. Young Mills and Mass Gap. This is the brief statement of the problem. It's essentially this a statement that, uh, that you don't see free massless gluons propagating. Uh, and, uh, and its status is unsolved. So there is a longer statement, which apparently Witten and Arthur Jaffe wrote it on the website. 
I think they may have upgraded the amount of money with inflation a bit for one minute. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, okay, so now, uh, so we know a few Nobody months ago. Nobody claimed that they have any progress in this, right? Because other claim problems that hundred times some claims come out. On this one, it's quiet, right? Well, like directly, well, there's lots of progress numerically, <laughs> right? right? Mm -hmm. but it, I think progress keeps happening. But, so, so we, decided just as a their type of thing we applied for a collabor Simon's collaboration um, you probably know some of them have been running for a while and I must say I wasn't was pretty sure we won't get selected but somehow we got selected and, <laughs> <laughs> well I mean and now we even have our simple this uh, crystal ball this is our crystal ball which was designed by Grisha Tarnopolsky which one of the but it's a very appealing image, I must say. <laughs> Apparently, it's made from Varanoid oscillations. There is some real mathematics, uh, mm. but this is supposed to symbolize confinement. Sorry, can you explain to non-experts what's the big deal? Suppose colorless states have less energy, then everything will become colorless. So well, what's they, the problem? They, they, in some sense, the colored objects have infinite energy. They never really observed here. And you want to know the details? Yeah, I, wa I want to know not just this fact, but also how to compute the masses of them and other properties. It's sort of a funny situation because like this Lagrangian, you can put on a t-shirt, right? It's a very short Lagrangian uh, and it poses the question very precisely. From this, there needs there is an infinite amount of data that follows that you can compare with experiment. And uh, that's the problem. But the only way in which we know how to do it, as I'll say in a moment, is uh, from very complicated numerical, non numerically intensive computations, but not analytically. And, uh, that, that's basically. So it's a beautiful formulation of a problem without a beautiful solution yet. But, um, OK. So, so this is, uh, so there is a strong NYU connection from this collaboration because Sergey is uh, one of the associate directors. And then we have people from different institutions and countries. And, uh, but we know that we're, what we're up against, we're up against 50 years of attempts to solve this problem. So, uh, so how do, how can you just start solving this problem? And this already happened in the early 70s because uh, what Wilson, maybe based on, there was some independent work by others, but he's all, often associated with this. He set up this Euclidean lattice gauge theory, which has been an amazing tool in convincing us that QCD is the right theory. And the, uh, it basically, uh, you can say, here is a question, like you have this QCD Lagrangian in the continuum, it's very complicated. How do I start solving it numerically? And he answered this question. And it's actually a very simple formulation. Uh, so here is the Wilson action. We basically discretize space, put it say on a cubic lattice, and for each face, people called it plaquette. Uh, for each plaquette, you have some, a bunch of U variables corresponding to directed links. Uh, and these belong to this SUN gauge group. For real world, it's SU3, but you can do SU2 if you want to, or SU4 and so on. Uh, and then you just take a trace of a product around uh, each plaquette and then sum them all up. And, and then you have to do the integral over the gauge group for each of these variables. So it's an immensely complicated integral, multidimensional integral. And then you have to take the lattice spacing to zero in an appropriate way. Uh, and the way is this asymptotic freedom way because this G uh, has to actually go to zero as lattice spacing 
goes to zero according to this rule. Uh, so now what people, and this kind of maps QCD into a problem in statistical mechanics with, uh, with this one over G, G squared being like uh, temperature. And then, so, so this was tremendously fruitful and many big collaborations are doing this. And then already in the 70s, there were big successes. For example, Michael Kreutz could see that, uh, could see this type of running and Wilson also and his group. Uh, and, uh, and one thing that people could do quite easily is to do strong coupling expansion, which is working in the opposite limit of large G. Then you just expand in these plaquette terms. And then you can see that the Wilson loop has the area law. And this is the criterion for confinement because uh, the area law for Wilson, if you think about this large Wilson loop, it's like the process where you create a quark anti quark, separate them by a large distance, propagate them for a large distance, and then they annihilate. So if there is a linear potential between the quarks, then you will get factor of R here and the factor of T here, and you get the area law. Uh, sorry if this was too fast, but this is, so in a pure blue theory where there are no quarks and just gluons, this is a rigorous criterion for confinement. And people can see it sort of from strong coupling expansion. And then the main question is, is there some kind of a transition as you go from strong to weak coupling? But then things get like quite complicated and uh, but the bottom line is that it appears that there, that is, there is no transition. Question? Or, there's no transition and you really do see some pretty good ev numerical evidence for confinement from this lattice. And so initially how do we know that this matches the perturbative part? Well, I'll show you a picture. I, I think it's already for many years, people. So I believe like Michael Kreutz, uh, what I heard is that Wilson was originally not sure how, whether it would take 10 years or 100 years to see this, but it worked a lot better than expected apparently, already early on. And now, and initially people worked on small lattices, so you could criticize that, but now people, Actually, these pure glue theories, you can really do a fine job on them and go to huge lattices. And, and this is just the beginning. Really. So one of the big components of our collaboration is to the improved, uh, and we have several lattice experts in the collaboration team for doing this. Uh, OK, so, so I'll, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just, sorry, I'll skip this just for a second and just show you what people do see on the lattice. They do see the string formation very well. Like this is, if you put say a probe quark and the probe anti-quark, you really do see that, that somehow the action density bunches up into a string and that's responsible for this linear potential. And this is a highly non-trivial phenomenon. So on one hand, at short distances, you expect the Coulomb potential and you do see a Coulomb-like potential for a little while, but then the flux lines, instead of like dipole and QED, they get collimated and form the string. And this is a picture from a real lattice simulation, which was done already many years ago by Line Weber's group. And one of the things that, for example, Sergei studies a lot is a more precise structure of this string, like its excitation levels and, and so on. Uh, Okay, and I'll show a bit more like uh, people do see transition from this columnic to linear potential very well. And in fact, the transition in some sense happens earlier than, than one might have expected. So, so you see confinement, some signs of confinement already at relatively weak coupling. I think that's, that's it. Okay, so, so but now let me sprinkle in some of the more, some of the work that sort of, of course, there is this big goal, but then there are some much simpler models. And then another anniversary is it's 60 years of the Schwinger model. So that model is often viewed as a kind of toy model for UCD. It's really QED in one plus one dimension. 
very simple model, but it has some of the features. So this is just a brilliant theory, and it has a theta angle, which couples to electric field, and some charged fermions. And for Schwinger, it was, uh, he made an amazing discovery that in a, you have a gauge theory, but then you don't see any massless degrees of freedom. You can only see bosonic bound states that are massive. And he discovered that the shrink, this boson mass is E over square root of pi. Now, E in one plus one dimensions has units of mass. When H bar and C are one, which is what we always use. Uh, so, unlike in three plus one D, where it's dimensionless here, this is a reasonable answer. And basically, you see like a tightly bound bound state of electron and positron forming this boson. But the amazing thing is that when the quark is, or the electron is massless, uh, this Schwinger boson is free. There are no interactions of these bosons at all. And that could not have been easily predicted. Uh, and then there was actually a lot of work. I think some of it was in some of the seminal work was at NYU by Lowenstein and Spiaka. Uh, but then there was a big progress in the mid 70s due to bosonization. So I won't go into bosonization, but uh, but here is what we did just a few months ago, which is another approach to lattice, where instead of Euclidean lattice, we really work in real physical time. So we keep time continuous and keep the space discrete. And then we just have a Hamiltonian. Uh, hope we won't bury this Hamilton. <laughs> but uh, so so uh, so there was this uh, this approach is often called the colgate saskind uh, approach to lattice gauge theory, and, and this approach has been barely explored in America compared to the Euclidean approach. It's like very much less utilized, because, and I'll show you in a second why. But I think there is some promise in this approach. Because when you say put fermions on the lattice, you have uh, these, uh, the, uh, it's called staggered fermions. So you put like uh, a doublet of fermions on two adjacent sites, say zero and one, and then there is another doublet and two and three, and so on. And these U's are just phases which uh, quantum phases e to the i phi. And, uh, and ln is uh, the momentum conjugate to the space. It's just derivative with respect to the phase. So this is this banks kogat saskin hamiltonian and, uh, and then actually there's been a lot of work on this. And if you look at the citability of these papers over the last few years, it's dramatically increasing. The question is why? Why would people go back to and the answer is that somehow it's related to quantum computers. It's a, it's a sort of toy model that you can test certain devices, like synthetic quantum systems. And in fact, some cutting edge people have devised some experimental realizations of this model. But long before then, people did a little bit more careful job. And actually, Chris Hamer worked for many years on this model. And he wrote down with these collaborators some set of constraints. This is just charge conservation constraints on the lattice. And this is sort of staggered, depending on there is minus one for, uh, for odd sites and zero even sites. And somehow people glossed over this. But, uh, but then we, as in the process of just learning this model, with uh, Silvio Pufo, who is my colleague at Princeton, and his student, Ross Dempsey, and Bernardo Zahn, our postdoc, we realized that they basically missed something. That they identified this lattice mass parameter with a continuum mass, but there really should be this shift. Uh, and this shift, when you take little m to zero, at this shifted mass, there is a kind of discrete symmetry protecting this point. So it's a much better place to study the massless model than, than the previous place. Uh, and uh, 
And then we notice that a lot of things kind of work much better at this point. So, uh, so it's a bit surprising. So it just shows that sometimes you go back to the old stuff, you can learn a little bit more from it. And in particular, when you do strong coupling expansion, uh, so you have this, uh, this, this parameter x is 1 over ea squared. So you first expand for small x, but then you have to extrapolate to very large x to get the continuum limit. And this extrapolation in the old days never worked well, uh, but after we shifted the mass from 0 to minus 1 quarter, this parameter, suddenly the precision dramatically increased. And just from this very simple procedure, we get within 0.1% of the Schwinger boson um, exact mass. But moreover, when you do it sort of the numerical work more carefully, you get like precision to five digits or something. Uh, so why was this model not used so much before is because there is a two, the number of degrees of freedom grows exponentially, right? Because the number of qubits is the number of lattice sites. So you have two to the n growth of the size of the matrix. And you can do exactly only up to like, I don't know, 20 lattice sites or something like that, 30, but not much more. But then there is a technique called DMRG, density matrix normalization group, which we tried to apply. And there are some experts on it. And then this mass shift, like, immediately improves even that. So, so that's sort of one QCD-like model that we can try to explore. And, uh, and uh, that sort of would be something new that we can do that wasn't done, like say, uh, even a few years ago. And hopefully uh, the idea would be not to do it just in one spatial dimension, but to do it in higher spatial dimensions. Okay, now this I already showed. So coming back to real QCD, I want to show the string formation, which people see numerically. Uh, and then there are even more complicated things like baryons. They have these so-called Y junctions. This looks like Y. And people also see these, uh, these junctions numerically. How strict are you about time limit? Uh, yeah, at least 50. Yeah, 50. Okay. Uh, so, so this coming back to regular trajectory. So, essentially, these uh, simplest mesons are like this string spinning around, and and from just spinning relativistic string, you do get this linear relation, which explains this what I showed originally. And you can even see what sort of uh, energy density you expect from this relativistic string. It's about 1.6 kilojoules per centimeter. Uh, but the problem is that you cannot stretch it too much because it can snap in the middle by quark anti quark creation. And that's at the core of why QCD is additional part, like on top of. But, but pretty early on, already, like right after 73, uh, there was this great physicist, uh, still is, uh, Hoff who came up with, with a brilliant idea to study instead of three colors and colors and take the large n limit. And that actually, uh, like I work, most of my papers are on something having to do with large n limits. So um, you can, I don't know if it's the best strategy in life, but it, it's certainly a good idea. It simplifies things quite a lot, but doesn't make the theory completely solvable still. Like in terms of Feynman diagrams, you only filter out these so-called planar diagrams where different gluon lines don't pass under each other. And this is called the Toft coupling, G squared n. You want to keep this fixed as n goes to infinity. And in particular, this large n limit suppresses the snapping of the flux tube. So you can make much longer flux tubes before they snap. So if n were not 3, but would be 133, uh, we would be in, the theories would be in much better shape. Because this, this trajectory would continue way up there. And there would be no doubt that we're really dealing with some string-like theory. 
even from experiments. But here you can say, oh, you're just seeing five points. And then it, so the real world is always in the hardest place, but, but definitely working on large N helps people a lot uh, as a kind of theoretical crutch. And now we can ask, so is three really a large integer, right? So sometimes it's not, but there are cases when it really is. So one thing that people have been doing, and these are members of our collaboration, actually, but long before then, they were doing just SUN, Euclidean, Wilson, lattice calculations, and plotting masses as a function of 1 over n squared. For in a theory without quarks, the corrections are in parts of 1 over n squared, and you see these wonderfully straight lines. That really means that the large n idea is working very well, uh, even down to n equals 3, which is this point. This is 2, 3, 4, and so on. So, uh, so you see that uh, small n really is large in a lot of these models, and so we're not too far off the mark. And now, and, uh, let me just describe some recent work where the evidence for it is even more uh, dramatic, which is a toy model, another toy model for QCD, which is 2D QCD with an adjoint matter, uh, which is like a toy gluino. It's not a gluon, but gluino, which just simplifies the theory quite a bit. And I've been playing for, with this theory already for more than 30 years. But somehow lately it's attracting a bit. It's much simpler than, just to give you an idea, it's something much simpler than QCD, still not exactly solved, but we, we know more about it. Than, uh, so it's just a one plus one dimensional model with the Majorana fermion, which is uh, which in the joint. So for example, for SU3, there are eight Majorana fermions. That, Majorana means it's just self-conjugate, like its dagger is equal to itself. Uh, so I won't tell you the intricacies of this model, but quite recently with, uh, with a group of, uh, with Fufu and two students, a uh, grad student and an undergraduate, Loki Lin, we did uh, some new calculations at finite end, which are a bit harder than what people were typically able to do before, partly because the computers are much more powerful and this is the set of, uh, this is a diagonalization of a certain Hamiltonian where you treat uh, uh, light cone time. You like propagate along light cone and you treat that as time. And you see like the lightest bound states made out of, this is essentially a two gluino bound state, this is three gluino and so on. And you see very little change from SU3 to SU4. These numbers all look with and rounding the same. Uh, and then you jump to n equal infinity, which is something we actually did even before because it's easier. Right? So n equal infinity is easier than n equal three. Uh, and see same number, like within the surrounding. And the one over n squared corrections here, you see how small they are. Like really, it explains why within rounding, this is the fit for one over n. So the, their size is really small for the lightest bound state, but then sort of grows a bit. But this is so for the this is three dimensions. This, this is one plus one dimension. One plus one dimension. Sorry to disappoint. So, but, I missed. but but yeah, this is one plus one, but it's a very complicated dynamical model, which has like adjoint degrees of freedom. Yes, so, the non abelian with Yeah, the non abelian yeah. adjoint. So to jump to 3D. Though. No, no, I, did, I showed 3D before. That there, you, you have to do like many hours of Monte Carlo. Here, it's a very different method, but, but it gives even. So in this model, the large N limit is really excellent. Uh, so that's like another thing to convince you that it's okay to go to large N, at least in some models. Okay, so. So by now I've told you about the real thing, uh, then two toy models, Schwinger model and the joint QCD. Here comes another toy model, which is ADS CFT correspondence, where you uh, take some, now a three plus one dimensional image theory and uh, which is not confining, but it has some amazing properties. There. 
and the call for supersymmetric angles theory. I assume you heard colloquy about it, so I won't uh, uh, tell you too much, but it's somehow dual to n dimensional string theory on a certain curved background, which includes hyperbolic space. Uh, so this comes from some article, review article that Maldesena and I wrote in 2009. It's to remind people of a spherical cow joke, but, but this was hyperbolic space tile bridge cows. So. But basically hyperbolic space is such that the, it's like a disk, but the circumference has infinite lengths. So there are many cows. But this, so this amazing, this is really an amazing duality, which, which allows you to study three plus one dimensional, very strongly coupled theory by mapping it to uh, geometry. And people have now, that's another anniversary, 25 years of ADS-CFT, founding on this model, like thousands of papers. We, uh, one can develop expansion in this gravitational approach and powers of inverse coupling, which is something totally new. It complements the usual Feynman graph expansion. And there is a lot of evidence this is correct, but there is no like systematic proof of it. But then what I want to say is that this is not just limited to a scale invariant theory. There is a way to also study confining theories. Maybe this is less well known, but so, for example, if the theory is scale invariant, then the quark anti quark potential is exactly Coulombic. So, you never enter this linear regime. And this was realized early on in ADS CFT days because this uh, is computed by studying the shape of the string bending into hyperbolic space. But, uh, but now, uh, to make it confining, you need some kind of deformation or infrared wall uh, as a toy model, this sort of works. But it turns out that there are not just, there are systematic 10-dimensional gravity models, and in particular, the, the model that Strassler and I wrote down, this really is as solid as, say, the ADS-5 process 5. It's a particular curved space called deformed conifold. That, that allows you to, and this is a confining theory. So I won't, don't have time to, even if I had time to explain it, it would be difficult, but, but it's basically a certain conical space with a smoothed out tip. It's a Calabria space, and, and then you deform it by some fluxes, and then you get, but here, here is the result what you can compute. So in this model, and this is actually an undergraduate student. It's from studying the shape of string. You do, to, you do see the transition from Coulombic to linear regime of the potential. Uh, and this is the, the similar transition in lattice theory. This is computed by one of the experts, Gunnar Bali. And here you see this Coulombic to confining transition and, and you see it in our sort of toy model. So, uh, so this result is already, you know, around 20 years old. Uh, it's not for QCD, but it's sufficiently uh, QCD like that. I think uh, people keep sort of studying it and there can be other similar type of models, hopefully. So why do you say it's not for QCD? Well, uh, this model, if you look at its details, it's the so-called cascading. First of all, it's n equal one supersymmetric. So it's more similar to a supersymmetric cousin of QCD, but also it has this uh, peculiar cascade of cyber dualities. It's basically, the, it's not asymptotically free, really. The theory manages to flow in such a way that it's rather strongly coupled even in the UV. But in the infrared, it does confine and it breaks chiral symmetry. So, so it's a pretty amazing three plus one dimensional toy model. Okay, I think I'll skip this because I'm pretty late on time. So, so why, uh, let me just conclude. So, so basically, I 
one thing that's clear is that confinement is an essential yet mysterious aspect of QCD. You write down this Lagrangian, which classically has massless propagating gluon degrees of freedom, and then, and it's supposed to describe real world on the nose. It really does, all evident. But how this transition from this Lagrangian to real world happens is very hard to see besides just doing these heavy numerical calculations. So, so we as formal theorists like toy models. So we study related phenomena in toy models and sort of see how, how it works there. Now we have part of the toolbox is this gauge gravity duality where mysteriously you see it popping out from the geometry. But we really want a deeper understanding. And, uh, and uh, so the hope is that, uh, that we will be able to return to some of the deep questions. And, and in particular, in lattice field theory, I think the numerics, one thing, I don't know if humans are getting sharper, it's not clear, but the computers are constantly getting more powerful. And this already helped in many ways. Uh, and I think in particular, these Hamiltonian approaches that I described uh, look promising and may provide new connections. And they're also quite amenable to quantum computation, at least in some cases. And then we need to improve connections between QCD strings and sort of these super strings in sort of space. And we hope to find new analytical ins insights and approximations to QCD. And we won't shy away from toy models because in our field, toy models is, uh, it's in some sense, hard business. I mean, you, you can, well, you've all read about SYT model in New York Times, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but some of the most famous models originally started as toy models, like the Easing model, the Hubbard model. They're really simple to state and if you are especially lucky, they will actually describe something in the real world. So, so that's the hope. So thank you for your attention. Questions from Marius? Okay. So you said that you have, uh, you are the director of this big new collaboration or something. So mm -hmm. after 10 years and millions of dollars, it's what not... would define the success of this collaboration? A nice toy model, a good calculation of the proton mass? Well, I think that's, that's open-ended. It's, it's understood that we are up against something that may be bigger than, than us, right? Because, but I think this is such a fundamentally important problem that, uh, that you know, it's all relative. Like even if you make like a, like a small progress on something very important and physically relevant, that can be counted as success. But, but for example, I think that like if you look at these Hamiltonian lattice models, they really tell you the wave function of the ground state of gauge theory. You can compute many things like the entanglement properties of the ground state. The, the entanglement entropy, the range entropy, the, things like that. The, that is the new stuff that's not really known about QCD at all. And that was one of the things that, that uh, we certainly uh, and hope to learn. So, so it's like a modern look at this problem where you bring in also techniques from from condensed matter physics and quantum computation and qubit systems is sort of one of the directions. One thing I didn't have time to talk about is that uh, additional motivation is that there have been experimental discoveries of exotic hadronic states, uh, which that's a separate, very vigorous field in itself. People discover these, uh, maybe I can just quickly flash it. There are these so-called tetraquark states, which uh, by now there are dozens of them discovered. And actually, at LHC, they discovered the Higgs and also dozens of this strongly interacting stuff. 
and their nature is quite mysterious still. So and then pro a lot of models deal with these bary baryonic vertexes, why junction is important for them. So there are just many, many roads pointing to, to the fact that this is a good time to return to strong interaction. And uh, they agreed with us <laughs> so far. <laughs> I mean, like in our field, like there is a lot of effort towards strong, say, quantum gravity, where again you're like using toy models for toy models, uh, zero plus one dimensional models for black holes. I've worked on that a lot, but but you know you can also do this. And, So about the baryon light junction, is there a string theory model for that? Uh, you mean like with, within the so so about well, string theory on the flux tube? Is there a um, right a yeah. way to incorporate this baryon? So that's actually where ideas CFT told us taught us a lot because um, or the D five brain. Yeah, yeah, it's the D five brain. So for n equal three, it's a junction of three strings. Mm -hmm. For large n. It's a junction of n string. So it's a very heavy object. But baryons are always sort of heavy. So here it may be actually one case where you don't want to be doing large n, but want to be really at n equal three because a lot of people who model these uh, exotic states they talk about diquarks, which are diquarks are really things that are that are only for n equal three. Anything. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Within within this large end philosophy, the white junction would not be like such a light object. Yeah. So, right. So, what do you think? The progress is going to be about um, understanding QCD yet? Uh, non zero theta and also at finite density, you know, where the usual previous computational methods cause a lot of problems. So you're yeah, the sign problem. Sign problem measure yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the, these new methods, I mean, what, you're being realistic about what mm -hmm. new, new methods, but also quantum computation may do, do for us. What is your opinion? Well, I think, I think uh, the one. The one thing that we're, which people are increasingly doing are these domain wall type fermions, mm -hmm. right, which are computationally intensive. But, uh, so that would really help a lot. Because to really implement chiral symmetry, so the, the staggered fermions, I described the toy model for staggered fermions, like this Hogan Sass kind. But it has some issues with fermion doubling, for example, and uh, so there are a lot of tricks for how to deal with fermions and chiral symmetry. So somehow lattice field theory is like it's a broad set of ideas, and, and uh, definitely there is a lot of progress there. Like lattice conferences. Uh, are huge, and there are almost no, very few formal theories to them. So we are now trying to start this sort of more of a dialogue with them. And, and a few people have been looking at these large end. So it's a corner of lattice theory, which can be sort of channeled towards more understanding of confinement rather than, say, other issues. But theta dependence, actually, ADS CFT has helped a little bit with that. Right? So it's just, uh, you, you can see the theta dependence in the confining model, which was sort of predicted even before. You know, like these parabola, yeah, 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 yeah. these cusps. Mm -hmm. That just falls out from. I know there are many critics of ADS CFT that. Uh, just uh, it's not related to anything, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's certainly not on the nose uh, related to real world, but some, I thought this state of dependence was a beautiful result that uh, already came out in 98. 
So one just has to get lucky, you know, you have to be selective with what you're computing. I only thought that there were two separate kind of toy things. One was a kind of canonical open closed in relations, which have examples, matrix models, and real mm -hmm. equals one, ADSCFT, right. so open chains, closed chains, they are the same. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is this other model that you describe your old stuff with uh, Annabellian figure that has a model of dimensions mm -hmm. or lattice quadro mechanical systems. I thought they were different from different worlds. Do, yeah, there does not there's, have these open closed. Right, right. There are small n models. For example, Schwinger model is just a U1 model, and that I believe, like for people, when people were initially working on confinement in the 70s, I think Schwinger model looked very large uh, for multiple reasons. Like it has the theta vector also and. So I think it's all good. Yeah, but what I meant was that, the, in my mind at least, of all the uh, two types of situations. One is ADSCFT goes to open close relations like that's matrix. part of the large end. Yeah, yeah right. that, that's part of the so large end. That's a one world. world. Yeah. Another world is at least going to lattice and uh, uh, discretizing only space and keeping the time of years. These are kind of different worlds. Now you're saying that but they can be. See, I, you can see them kind of merge, like th that's what one thing that people are doing more and more, which is instead of taking n equals three, this is what Mike Tepper was pushing a lot, go three, four, five, six, up to 12, and and, and they see this uh, very strong, yeah, maybe I should come back to this. This is really from hardcore lattice results. Uh, you, you see like they go to large n just by, directly and then they see indeed this twelfth philosophy works. But it just works by direct computation. But not with a fundamental reason like open core relations or no no here you don't there use no it. You, you just simulate yeah. it and let it directly. Maybe it's hidden somewhere, some principle. Yeah 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 the, we are trying to expand from different directions. It's kind of naive, but you saw at the beginning of the talk, like the Virasoro amplitude and, you know, the, you know, string theory, like it's an attempt to explain the strong interactions. And, I mean, you never came back to it, but like, it is a fact that, you know, if we, if we forgot about quarks, the low energy limit of that theory is also string theory. Not of the kind, you know, that we think of in terms of like a theory of gravity, but nevertheless, yeah. Well, I, th I think that uh, yeah. If you put string theory in this AD, uh, like curved space, so you you have to take that theory and put it in curved space, in ADS type space, and then it, it starts looking more like the real gauge theory. That that's what people were missing. But like what people were doing, say in nineteen eighty. 384 was taking 10 D super string, just studying it in flat space, and and you got all sorts of amazing results, but it still wasn't looking like UCD, and in particular, it had no hint at all of of uh, short distance behavior, which is like field theoretic. But but then, like in the ADS CFT era, people do see things that look like evidence. So it has to be asymptotically like ADS space, not like that. That's another direction which is by no means finished. Right, uh, we are out of time. Uh, maybe let's uh, thank Igor again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are now running for the playground. Oh, yeah.